Education is what's important. Training, preparation for the expected. Education, preparation for the unexpected. Good morning, Team Kulak community. And on behalf of Marine Corps University, the Marine Corps University Foundation, and the Brew Kulak Center for Innovation and Future Warfare, welcome back to the Brewcast, our series designed to connect the worlds of the warfighter and PME with the best and innovative and creative thought. I'm your host, Major Ian Brown, Operations Officer at the Kulak Center. Before we begin, please remember that all opinions expressed here are those of the individual and do not necessarily reflect the views of the United States Marine Corps, Marine Corps University, the Kulak Center, or any other agency of the U.S. government. We'll also be recording this webcast for the benefit of those in our community of interest who can't join us today. So we ask that you keep your own webcams off to help us stream smoothly and keep your microphones muted as well. At the conclusion of our guest presentation, we will have a brief question and answer session. So if you have a question as the, the presentation is ongoing, just type it into the group chat and then I'll go and ask them in the order in which they're received at the time that we have left. So our broadcast returns with an episode on something that's both an interesting historical case study of attempted mil military innovation, at least that's one aspect of it, as well as a initiative that's uh, close to the heart of our own namesake, Brew Krulak, and that's the combined action program undertaken by the Marine Corps during the Vietnam War. We have here Cavender Sutton, who has researched this program in detail and will be uh, just taking us through the next 45 minutes or so of research and insights that he found. Cavender Sutton is a fourth year PhD candidate in military history at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. His research concerns the manner in which armed forces learn and adapt over time. His forthcoming dissertation, Combined Action in Vietnam, Marine Corps Counterinsurgency Thought and Practice from 1958 to 1971, uses the Marines Combined Action Platoon Program as a window into how Cold War Marines understood insurgencies and how that understanding influenced the techniques they use in Vietnam. Prior to his graduate studies, Cavender also served in the United States Marine Corps and deployed to Afghanistan from 2010 to 11, and again in 2012. And following completion of his doctorate, he plans to continue his research and instruction in professional military education. And we uh, we hope maybe we'll have him here as a return guest, maybe in the future once the research is done and he's ready to, to get into that teaching full time. Uh, so with that, Cavender, thank you very much for your time. Thanks for joining us today, and I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Brown, and uh, thank you very much for having me. All right, so as the title suggests, uh, today we're going to discuss the Marine Corps' Combined Action Platoon Program during Vietnam. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with the program, here's a brief table of organization. Uh, generally speaking, it's, it was envisioned as a 15-man squad, 14 Marines, one corpsman, uh, embedded in a Vietnamese village around the clock, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days out of the year, uh, so long as the cap was uh, assigned to be in that village. Now, it's really interesting. These were all enlisted units led by a non-commissioned officer. Uh, when the program began, it was envisioned as, you know, a senior NCO, a sergeant who's been around for a while, ideally a sergeant who's on his at least second, if not third enlistment. Uh, but oftentimes there's corporals, you know, 20, 21 year old corporals, uh, Marines with just a few years of time and grade uh, leading these caps, which I, I find quite fascinating. Simply put, they're trained to it. They're assigned to train, advise, and if need be, and often they did, fight alongside local ways militias known as popular forces, uh, which I will call PF for short. Uh, generally, there were about 30 popular force soldiers to a platoon. Uh, here you see a picture of a popular force soldier, uh, approximately late 1965, early 1966. I'm not sure exactly when, uh, but the popular forces were an interesting bunch. In theory, they're made up of men who were either too old or too young to be drafted into the army of the Republic of Vietnam. However, they didn't always happen. Uh, like, you know, any, any, anyone else in a war that's been dragging on for, for, you know, 10 plus years like this one did, you know, the, the PFs had personnel issues like everyone else did. Uh, so often they would take volunteers of all ages. So oftentimes PFs would volunteer for the force simply to avoid Arvin forces. Uh, it would allow them to stay close to home. Oftentimes, they just didn't have the motivation to leave home and go off and fight what they saw as a losing war. Uh, the Popular Force's biggest disadvantage was their lack of support from the government of Vietnam. Uh, they were very poorly trained, if at all, oftentimes not at all. They were given antiquated weapons, most of which were U.S. hand-me-downs from World War II and the Korean War. As you see here in this picture, this soldier is carrying an M1A1 carbine, which was primarily used in, uh, in World War II to a lesser extent in Korea. They were very, very poorly paid uh, as a result, very poorly organized, very low morale. Um, also, there was no centralized command of these popular forces at all. Uh, generally, they, they fell under the control of the district chief, uh, 
uh, provincial chiefs, you know, provincial level governments, in theory, were supposed to have control over these platoons. But based off of what I've seen, that rarely ever happened. However, early on, several Marine leaders, including Ma Major General Lewis Walt, who was the I Corps commander from 1965 to 1967, recognized their biggest advantage and greatest source of potential was that they were local forces. They served in the villages in which they grew up and in which they lived. Therefore, they knew the people, they knew the terrain. Most importantly, they understood the social and political dynamics at play in each village. Now, this could be a blessing and a curse. If a PF was motivated to fight, he could be an indispensable asset to the Marines in that location. If he was not, he could be apathetic at best, antagonistic at worst. Uh, my research has found plenty of examples of both, the former much more common than the latter. Uh, but if you've been downrange before, you know that you know an apathetic, you know, an apathetic set of boots is practically useless in a combat situation. So this is the kind of issues that these combined action Marines had to contend with as they tried to make uh, this, you know, this ad hoc program of innovation work. Now, in historiography, uh, if you've been a Marine or if you follow the Vietnam, I'm sure you've heard of this book, Being West, the Village. Uh, Being West subsequently wrote a book called One Million Steps about my first deployment in Afghanistan. I highly recommend you check it out. But this is the most, you know, <clears throat> this is considered the gold standard of calf historiography. Uh, and not to say that the village is a poor book, but it, it sort of leaves the impression that all, all cap platoons shared the experience that these Marines here at Ben Niha, as the village was called, shared. But that's not really the case. Uh, but unfortunately, this program has largely been been ignored, omitted, skipped over uh, in Vietnam War historiography, which is rather striking because there are mountains now of, of studies on the Vietnam War, many of which are quite good. Uh, as of now, there are only three monographs dedicated explicitly to the program, plus one of oral histories. I recommend you read them all. But I've noticed that reading through them, you know, none of them quite, quite contextualize the program and, and, and explain its true value. And, and, and really interesting dichotomy I've noticed in the literature is that the few the few books that deal directly with the CAP program, they, they generally leave you with uneven conclusions. You know, they were okay in this matter, but they were okay in that matter, but. Whereas other works that that discuss the the, uh, the, the program in passing, notably John Nagel's Learning to Eat Soup with a Knife, works like that, they tend to leave much more, you know, much more decisive, much more affirmative assessments of the program's vitality. Uh, some of those are positive, some of those are negative, but I, I found that quite interesting. And as I, as I continue with this research, you know, I, I noticed that, you know, really perhaps from a historical perspective, the real, the real value in studying the CAP program doesn't really lie in judging its overall effect. Uh, it does not lie in judging its overall impact in the war effort, because the unfortunate truth is the program was never expanded beyond 114 caps. Uh, that's what it hit at its height in the middle of 1969. And really only 1.5% of all U.S. Marines who served in Vietnam found themselves serving in a cap platoon. So its true value, I would argue, is that the Combined Action Platoon program actually provides a window into how Cold War Marines understood insurgencies, how they understood themselves and how they understood their role in combating insurgencies during the Vietnam War era. And that's what we'll talk about today. Before we go any further, not to insult anyone's intelligence, uh, I'm, I'm sure we have a very well-read audience here, but uh, just to really quickly de uh, define insurgency and counterinsurgency, uh, FM 3-24, the 2014 edition, defines insurgency as the organized use of subversion and violence to seize, nullify, or change political control of a region. It defines counterinsurgency as the comprehensive civilian and military efforts to design, excuse me, design to simultaneously defeat and contain insurgency and address its root causes. You'll notice, all right, there's two parts to this. There's a military element and there's a political element to it as well. And that latter definition is not far, not that different from what the Marines took with them to Vietnam. The 1962 FMFM TAC 21 Operations Against Guerrilla Forces. This was, you know, the, the most updated handbook on coin that Marines brought with them to Vietnam in 1965 define counterinsurgency as, quote, the entire scope of military, paramilitary, political, economic, psychological, and civic actions taken by or in conjunction with the existing government of a nation to defeat an insurgency. So with that in mind, as you can see from these two definitions, they're really not that different. Um, but I want you to keep in mind there are two sides of coin. There is a hard side of coin. That's kinetic, all right? It's focused on rooting out and destroying enemy combatants, doing what Marines do best, locating, closing with, destroying the enemy. There's also a soft side. Uh, it's more political, it's socially oriented, all right? It's aimed at gaining locals' trust and building a sense of political legitimacy. That last part is key. If you can't build political legitimacy, 
the whole operation fails. We learned that the hard way in Afghanistan. Uh, after, you know, uh, after coalition forces left in August of 2021, the whole country collapses in two weeks. Uh, General Mark Milley, when he testified before Congress, he said, we cannot build a state from the outside. If you don't build a sense of political legitimacy among the people that you're fighting among, the operation will fail. So first, we now need to discuss the knowledge, the coin knowledge, excuse me, that Marines brought with them to Vietnam. Uh, now, for brevity's sake, I'll kind of gloss over this phase of, the, of, of our discussion, uh, but it is not uncommon for scholars to assert that, you know, the foundations of Marines' small irregular warfare knowledge was formed during the Banana Wars, a period largely viewed from 1898, the Spanish-American War, until 1934. And that's not without reason. The Corps was involved particularly with three interventions in Haiti, the Dominican Republic, and Nicaragua from 1915 to 1934. In each case, Marines were ordered to secure a beachhead, stabilize the military and political situations, and then neutralize armed resistance. And in each case, Marines accomplished their mission to varying degrees of success by first securing the coastline, then imposing some form of military government, building up an indigenous constabulary force, and then pushing the and pursuing the guerrillas' base areas further inland. Lesson lear lessons learned from the Marines' experiences were codified in the famous Small Wars Manual, the cover of which is pictured here on the right. You can find a PDF copy uh, through MCU Press online. But what's interesting about this manual that I want to note here is that it came about precisely because Marines noticed during these three interventions, there was no transfer of knowledge from one theater to the next. Uh, the Marines first landed in Haiti in 1914 when they landed a year later in, uh, in the Dominican Republic. There was no effort to translate what Marines in Intervention 1 have learned in Intervention 2. Later, when they land in Nicaragua, the same, the same situation arises again. So in each case, the first Marines who arrive in these areas, they're, they're basically starting over from scratch. They repeat many of the same mistakes and learn many of the same lessons their comrades had learned in earlier deployments. But one key thing that stands out to this manual is that it is a document for fighting a guerrilla force, not an insurgency. And there is a difference, right, as the last slide demonstrated. Political matters are mentioned, uh, but they're hardly left to civilian entities. That makes total sense. Uh, but if you've ever been deployed in a counterinsurgency setting, uh, unfor you know, sometimes your kinetic forces, your actual, your armed Marine infantrymen, they are going to be responsible for at least supporting those soft side coin operations. Uh, and this is not to criticize the manual. It is well suited for the circumstances under which these lessons were learned. However, as the Marines are going to learn in 1965 and beyond, irregular warfare, small wars, they're going to take on a new ideological, nationalistic, and revolutionary nature after the Second World War. Now, to their credit, in 1962, under the presidency of John F. Kennedy, the Marines and the Army did realize that they needed to update their doctrine in this matter. Uh, in 1962, the Marine Corps published FMFM TAC 21 Operations Against Guerrilla Forces, pictured here on the right. Not long after, the U.S. Army published FM 31 TAC 22 U.S. Army Counterinsurgency Forces, pictured here on the left. These are remarkably similar manuals. Each articulates a foundationally sound understanding of insurgencies, and they basically offer the same definitions of coin. Uh, FMFM TAC 21, if you will recall, I, I presented that definition earlier in this talk. They have similar strengths. Both provide logical and at times extensive discussions on counterinsurgency social and political complexities, as well as detailed instructions on forming indigenous forces to combat an irregular foe. They also have similar weaknesses, uh, most glaring of which is that both of them ignore war termination completely. And as we found out in August of 2021, that is a highly, highly delicate affair. Now, these manuals do have two main areas of disagreement. One, describe, one deals with terminology. I think it's very interesting that FMFM TAC 21 is aimed against guerrilla forces, as its title suggests. Throughout the text, it constantly uses terms as guerrilla, guerrilla forces, rather than insurgents and insurgency, which the Army manual has begun to use by 1963. I argue this suggests that Marines are leaning heavily on their previous experiences enshrined in the Small Wars manual, which uses the same terminology. Another area of disagreement concerns sustainment. How do insurgencies sustain themselves? And by that, by extension of that, how do you concentrate your forces during a counterinsurgency operation? The Army adheres to what numerous scholars have called the partisan model. It assumes insurgent forces must receive direct support from an outside sponsoring power. It's rooted in the Army's observations of partisan activities in fascist occupied regions of Europe and South Asia during World War II, and in communist insurgencies in Greece, Malaya, and South Korea immediately after the war. All of them had support of an outside power to varying degrees. The insurgent model 
which is what the Marine Corps manual subscribes to, acknowledges that a sponsor can play a significant role, but it also recognizes that a guerrilla force can sustain itself if it maintains access to the local population. This is a, correct, a, a, a characteristic that Victor Krulak notoriously pushed, notoriously latched onto. He amplified this, and he did his best to insert this into the Marines' mindset as they prepared for an intentional irregular conflict. Now, through coercion or cooperation, a, a guerrilla force could extract food, taxes, and recruits, and take shelter among the population if they are allowed to maintain a connection with them. Now, this explains differing U.S. Army and U.S. Marine operational behavior in the war's early years. If you study these early campaigns, the Marines' largest operations occurred along the coastline. The Army's largest operations, notoriously the 7th Cavalry's insertion into the Iodrang Valley, uh, <clears throat> occur along the, in, in the hinterland near the borders. Now, how did Marines actually train for war? before they first arrived in Vietnam 1965. This is where the story gets interesting. They dedicated an overwhelming majority of their time and effort to integrating helicopters and hellebore movement into their amphibious capabilities in the interwar years. The chief question that they tried to solve was how do you land large amounts of combat power ashore quickly in a potentially nuclear environment? That was the motivating factor, the introduction of atomic weapons. Now, there was a 1957 report on force organization and structure uh, no, no, called the Hagaboom, uh, the Hagaboom Board Report, excuse me. Uh, the entire thing is in the archives there at Marine Corps University. And it does conclude that Marines were unlikely to fight the USSR or Warsaw Pact forces directly. Their most likely engagement would be against Soviet proxies along the global per periphery. It argued that amphibious and vertical involvement efforts should continue as it will prepare the Corps for both high and low intensity conflict. So it's almost like they're trying to have a, you know, like, like a joint force capability is what they're trying to develop. While this is all going on, there were certainly some rhetorical shifts towards irregular warfare and counterinsurgency in the early 1960s. Again, this coincides with John F. Kennedy's presidency. There's a large volume of guerrilla warfare and coin material published in the Marine Corps Gazette starting in 1962. In fact, the January 62 edition is totally de uh, um, dedicated to the subject. Counter guerrilla counter training is also first introduced into the basic school curricula in 1961. That is the six month course that all newly minted Marine second lieutenants must attend between officer candidate school um, and their MOS training. There are 51 hours of instruction by 1962, 78 hours of instruction by 1964. The 1964 syllabus describes this unit of instruction's purpose as, quote, to impart a general knowledge of the history and causes of insurgency movements and the counterinsurgency actions necessary to combat them to impart a specific knowledge about the tactical principles and techniques of employment of small infantry units and counter guerrilla operations, and to, base, to develop a basic ability to employ <clears throat> tactically the rifle platoon in counter guerrilla operations. And this quote right here, and this is not the only one, but I'm zeroing in on this one, this quote highlights the main issue with training for counterinsurgency prior to Vietnam. It is entirely focused on the hard side of coin, locating, closing with, destroying enemy forces. It is an important element of coin, but it is only half the battle. What I've noticed in my research, and, and again, you, you can't expect, you know, an 18-year-old Lance Corporal or an 18-year-old PFC to, to just get off of a helicopter and automatically understand, you know, social political dynamics, have, have a yearning to understand local history and local culture. However, you have to at least try to teach the importance of those aspects as you're training Marines for a potential irregular conflict. It's also important to have them understand that COIN is a primarily political undertaking. Now, there is strong evidence that some flag officers, namely Lieutenant General Victor Krulak, understood and fully embraced these social and political dynamics. But the actual training that Marines performed before Vietnam was totally focused on the hard side of COIN. And that leads us to how CAF was created. One thing to understand, when the first Marines arrived in Vietnam in March 1965, there was no plan for CAF. There was no plan to do anything like this. Obviously, there's no contingency plan in a footlocker being offloaded off a plane for something called the Combined Action Platoon Program. <clears throat> it began purely out of necessity. The first Combined Action Platoons were established in August of 1965 around the Fubai Combat Base, pictured here in the middle. The city of Hue, which I'm sure you've all heard of, is located just up here to the northwest. And this is the northernmost of the Marines' original three bases in South Vietnam. Now, there's two things to understand here. One, there was no plan for anything like CAP as we've established. All right. And two, when it was established, it was not to start as a, it did not start as a hearts and minds initiative. There, there's nothing about the soft side of coin that dictated how and why these platoons were began. 
Now, 3rd Battalion, 4th Marines was originally responsible for this area of operations. And as the situation deteriorated, BLT 3-4 was ordered to push out and expand its security bubble around the Fubai combat base. Now, they quickly ran into two problems. Number one, even as they pushed out, and they primarily were, gonna, were concentrating their operations in this area here to the southwest, known as Zone A, they noticed that in their rear, insurgents or guerrillas were, were infiltrating into these villages and launching rocket mortar attacks on the airfield. Uh, simply put, by the summer, the battalion commander realized that he had more battle space than he could possibly cover with a lone battalion. However, due to political constraints, he's not getting any more reinforcements. So the issue he has to he has to confront is how do I secure my rear area while simultaneously trying to expand my security bubble? Now, one of his civil affairs officers, a first lieutenant John Mullen, came to him with an idea. You know, he said, "Look, sir, uh, there are these local units named Popular Forces. Now, they're not particularly good." Uh, they're not particularly motivated. However, they're locals. They know the area. And despite being poorly trained, equipped, and motivated, they could present a potential solution to the defensive problem that the, that 3 4 was facing around Fubai. The trick was to figure out how to adequately train and motivate them to fight. So the battalion commander first experimented by sending rifle platoons into the villages by day to train, run day patrols with these popular forces. Uh, that met moderate levels of success. However, at the end of the day, by and large, the rifle platoons, they are TB. When the sun goes down, the popular force troops, they take off their, their uniforms, they hide their weapons, and they just revert back to the same behavior that they were using before the Marines arrived. Clearly, the issue is not going to be solved unless Marines can stay and fight. Now, however, the, the original issue is that he doesn't have enough people. So he decides, all right, I'll leave squads. So he taps a, a Marine first lieutenant named Paul Eck to oversee the project. He tells them to select, you know, four squads worth of Marines, train them up, send them in, into these villages, and leave them there live alongside the popular forces, train them day and night, patrol alongside them day and night, surely that will boost their confidence. Uh, now, Eck was chosen because he had previously previously deployed to South Vietnam with a special forces advisor unit. He knew Vietnamese, the Vietnamese language. He knew the culture. He knew the history. Uh, a criminally short explanation of what he did is that he selected his Marines, roughly 45 in all. He basically gave them one, one week crash course in you know, the basics of the Vietnamese language, Vietnamese culture trying to teach them about the social and political dynamics that dictated village life. And then these Marines were released to go live and work inside of these villages. Uh, right here, you see this Marine holding this rifle. This is Paul Eck. Uh, these men are here on the left are some popular forces soldiers in 1965. And the first four caps were established here, uh, sort of a semi-circle around the Fubai combat base. And things worked well enough at first. Uh, enemy fire from these areas on the airfield subsided. Uh, CAP's presence allowed the 3-4 line companies to concentrate clearing areas beyond the airfield's immediate surroundings. The popular forces were more willing, but still sometimes reluctant, to go out on patrols and ambushes as long as the Marines went with them. In some cases, village elders and other local leaders who were friendly to the government of Vietnam felt safe enough to start sleeping in their homes again. And the Marines didn't realize at the time, but some of these CAPs, particularly the southernmost position here at Loc Banh, lay along key trailheads that connected coastal villages with Viet Cong havens in the mountains. So they established two more to the north. And by the end of the year, as this map shows, all hell breaks loose around this area, particularly around this trailhead here at Loc Ban. Now, three, four commanders, they interpret this as a sign that caps are angering and disrupting Vietnam forces. And in a lot of cases that they were. However, this is a sneak pattern of a sneak preview of a broader pattern that were emerged where for most of the program's existence, cap effectiveness is going to be judged based on the same metrics as regular infantry battalions or ever regular infantry platoons, based off the number of patrols ran, amount of contact, enemy casualties inflicted, et cetera, et cetera. Now, in early 1966, the CAP concept will expand to Denang, by far the Marines' largest area of operations in the early days in Vietnam. And this is where the story, again, gets, takes an interesting turn, and it becomes a bit problematic. Uh, this is a massive AO. There are originally three battalion landing teams, 1-3, 1-9, and 3-9, and they spend the latter half of 1965 constantly running operations, trying to secure this area, trying to expand that security bubble. But they're running into the same issues that 3-4 ran into up at Fubai, and that is that bad guys are using the villages behind them to get dangerously close to the airfield and launch attacks from there. So eventually, Lewis Walt, he takes note of the experiment going on at Fubai. He sees the popular forces as an untapped asset who could hold villages that the Marines and Arvin forces had already cleared. So he decides to try to replicate the program. However, much like those Marines in the Banana Wars, half a century before, 
at Da Nang, these, the Marines make the same mistakes or they, they repeat the same errors that the Marines at Fubai had made just a few months before. Uh, in December of 1965, 3rd Battalion, 9th Marines is assigned to go into villages by day, train popular force units, but they do not establish a permanent presence. So they run into the same problem. The, the popular forces, they stand relatively tall. They go on patrols. They, they take part in their training activities as long as the Marines are there. Once the Marines depart, they revert back to their earlier behavior. So in February, the Marines realized that they have to do what the Marines in Fubai had done, leave small units in these villages. So they establish a set of caps around the Neng. And by July 1965, all these dots represent individual caps around this area. And General Walt's stated intention here was to use the popular forces and caps, quote, to hold the rear areas by fighting the Viet Cong in those villages, end quote, in order to free up for infantry forces for offensive operations further inland. As far as I can tell, that is the extent of the instruction they were given. Unlike at Fubai, these Marines received no preparatory training whatsoever, nothing about language, nothing about culture, uh, nothing about living among the Vietnamese. They were just selected, dropped in the village, and told, hey, boys, they're that way. Go get them. And their orders overall are to go out, find, and kill VC. That's exactly what they did. They were Marines. They leaned back on what they knew how to do best, and that is precisely what they did. These cats make frequent contact with the VC, which, again, is, a, is interpreted as a sign that they are working. General Wald is quite pleased with the earlier returns. He orders more caps created. As the map here on the right shows, <clears throat> uh, they are placed along primary, you know, other than the airfield, they are placed along lines of communication here that run from the main base at Da Nang out to more remote infantry battalions that are operating in the country's hinterland. And this entire process, it repeats itself when CAP expands to Chu Lai in the summer of 1966, which is the Marine's southernmost enclave. As elements of the 1st Marine Division begin to arrive in force in that area, they run into the same problem. They're running clearing operations, but they can't hold the rear areas. So again, they, 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 they uh, decide to copy the CAP concept, and they more or less follow the pattern that was a that Denang used. No preparatory training. Uh, in fact, these CAP platoons, in a lot of cases, the command chronology show, were actually used as small clearing forces. They were honestly dropped in, in villages that had not been cleared. Uh, the village of Ben Niha made famous uh, in the book The Village. That is precisely what happened to the Marines there. They moved into an unpacified, unsecured location and were told not only to, to hold the area, not only to build relationships in the area if they could, but first they had to clear it. Some of these Marines did receive rudimentary training, uh, but most didn't. It depended on time and location. And more or less, this is the, the period that CAP is going to, excuse me, the, the, the pattern that new CAPs will follow for the program's first two and a half years up until the Tet Offensive. So let's talk about how CAP changed, excuse me, how Tet changed CAP. Uh, now, by December 1967, there's roughly 100 combined action platoons all along the I Corps tactical zone, those five northernmost South Vietnamese provinces that constitute three mass area of operations. They're mostly located along main supply routes and around major military installations. Makes total sense. The highest concentrations are around the, from, from south to north are around the Chu Lai Airfield, the Da Nang Airfield, and along Highway 1 running north to south um, to and from Da Nang around Phu Bai and along Highway Run running south from Hue. Uh, that's the picture depicted here. And finally, around, along Route 9, uh, which runs parallel to the demilitarized zone, connects the Dong Ha combat base to Khe San, uh, which is, was immortalized in Marine Corps War. Uh, now, these caps mostly, especially around here on Hue, they're running into heavy contact throughout 1967. Uh, these hotel caps I, I use as a case study uh, for a chapter in my dissertation, where essentially this is this is CAP performed almost to perfection based on the order these Marines were given. They're making contact very frequently. Uh, they are scoring high numbers of enemy casualties. Uh, based off the intelligence that are gathering, they are disrupting the Viet Cong and local NVA units, massing for Tet. Uh, they're preventing them from, uh, from getting access to the village areas here. See, the, the, the bad guys are, are sheltering up in these mountains. They're trying to come down to these village areas along the highway and along the coastline to get food, to get recruits, to get taxes. Um, I wouldn't go as far as to say that the caps were totally severing that link, but they were definitely frustrating those efforts. So it's not a coincidence that when the Tet Offensive begins and when the communist forces are running preparatory operations, they are targeting these caps. Dozens of caps are, are hit either in the opening hours of Tet or just before. Nearly every single cap on this map 
is attacked in the opening hours of the Tet Offensive. Many of them are overrun. However, in no case uh, were the bad guys able to hold the ground. In every single case, the Marines were either able to hold on to their position or counterattack and retake it um, after BC and NVA forces uh, had taken the ground. But what's interesting here is that what, what, what Tet, Tet tells Marine commanders is that, you know, maybe we're not doing something right with how we're emplacing these combined action platoons and how we're employing them. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Robert Kelly, who oversaw all the cap platoons here around Kubai, he was actually rethinking and arguing as early as the fall of 1967 that perhaps establishing compounds uh, depicted here in this map on the left and this picture on the right, perhaps that's not the way to go. You know, it, it's essentially a small patrol base that these platoons are based out of. Now, the advantage is that you have a physical projection. Of, of Marine Corps and more importantly, South Vietnamese government power within each village that hosts a cap. That's good. If the locals need help, they know exactly where to go. Uh, if the corpsman is running you know, a medical clinic, the locals know exactly where to go. But on the flip side, if the bad guys want to attack these Marines and PFs, they also know exactly where to go. Uh, especially in 1967, in the Tet, uh, most combined action platoons had just a horrifically high casualty rating. Uh, based off of the the research that I've done off of the Marines, the CAP Marines that I have personally surveyed, which is well over 50, uh, something like 58% of them were Purple Heart recipients. Uh, um, and that's that's a lot. <laughs> that, that That's higher than a lot of mainline infantry units. So their decision was to take was to go mobile. Uh, right here is a picture of CAP Hotel 8 the morning after Tet. Uh, as you can see, it was destroyed. This CAP was was a uh, was temporarily overrun but the marines did hold on so the solution was to go mobile uh they closed down the patrol bases they closed down the compounds and what the platoons decided to do was essentially run a never-ending satellite patrol they're never going to stay in one place for very long they're never going to hunker down in one spot they're constantly going to be on the move so that the bad guys don't know where and how to find them as with the compound caps there are advantages and there are disadvantages from the bad guy's perspective, it is now much more difficult to find them. Uh, the command chronologies do not indicate a, you know, compared to before Ted, I'm not going to compare it to during Ted, but compared to before Ted, uh, they're, they're still making contacts relatively frequently. However, the casualty rates go down significantly, largely because these compounds are not getting hit, they're not getting overrun anymore, because there's no concentrated compound from which to attack, or, or on which to attack. Excuse me. Now, on the flip side, it's more difficult for the bad guys to find the Marines, but it's also more difficult for the civilians to find them. Uh, now, I've I've received mixed reviews on this matter from combined action Marines. Some of them do have reported that you know some locals were more willing to come forth with intelligence once they had gone mobile, because now the locals don't have to worry about being seen, you know, by their neighbors for going to the cap compound, you know, because not not everyone knows where it is. However, more of them have reported that it was more difficult to establish a strong connection with the villagers because, you know, they're, they're, they're living and operating like ghosts, kind of like the Viet Cong. You know, they're, they're becoming more, more proficient at fighting the Viet Cong, but they're doing that sort of by living and operating like, like you know, like gorillas themselves. Uh, one corpsman that I discussed who arrived in Vietnam the second week of January 1968, not a good time to get to Vietnam, uh, but he, you know, he served both in a compound cap and in a mobile cap. And he was saying that with doing his, you know, his daily or weekly med caps, you know, a medical clinic, when he was in a compound, he would have patients from sun up to sundown. However, after they went mobile on his best day, he might get a dozen all day long, uh, simply put, because the locals didn't know where to find him. And for obvious reasons, his platoon is not going to go around, you know, broadcasting their location. Essentially, what these <clears throat> what these mobile caps would do was during the day, they would establish a day haven that would move every single day. Uh, this picture right here is a day haven sometime in 1970. I believe it is in the area around Fubai. Uh, some of the Marines would sleep, you know, perform weapons maintenance, cook, whatever they have to do. Other Marines would perform would perform day day patrols. These are mostly security patrols, presence patrols. They're not running into a lot of contact. And then at night, they would move to an ambush spot. Oftentimes, they would set up as many as three, uh, usually two. Uh, but it, this really, really, really frustrated uh, Viet Cong and NVA forces in the area because they're always moving around. They're always moving to a new location. Another downside dealt with doing with the PS. If your popular forces were motivated, if they were dependable, then yeah, not a whole lot changed. However, you have to tell them a new location to meet you every single day. Number one, that creates a security dilemma. What if you don't trust that popular force soldier? 
What if you think he's sympathetic to the VC? He might be VC himself. Are you willing to tell him where you're all going to meet up? Some Marines aren't willing to do that. So that diminishes the amount of popular forces that they have at their disposal. Some popular force soldiers might not have been Viet Cong. They just didn't show up. Uh, there's no centralized compound for them to go to. And, you know, they're worried about, you know, moving through the village by themselves to go find wherever it is that they're supposed to rendezvous with the Marines. Uh, so the, the, the shift to mobile, it, it solved a lot of problems for the combined action platoon, uh, but it created a whole host of new ones as well. Now, the one major positive thing that did accompany this shift to mobile was that the, the CAP program finally gets its own command structure. Believe it or not, for over three years, from August of 1965 until October of 1968, the CAP program did not have a dedicated centralized command structure. Uh, a Marine Lieutenant Colonel named Robert Corson, who you probably heard of, he wrote a book called The Betrayal. Um, he made a valiant attempt to do so in 1967. Um, I, I don't have time to get into his career, but it's quite fascinating. Um, you know, he was going to take care of his Marines no matter what. That rubbed a lot of people the wrong way. He was suddenly relieved to command, uh, and, and much of his efforts fell by the wayside. However, after Tet, Marine commanders realized that we need some sort of administrative, some sort of command and control apparatus to oversee this program. By the end of 1968, you finally have all the cap platoons that are uh, they're organized into four combined action groups, CAG for short. From north to south, you have the fourth CAG, which is around the DMZ, third CAG, that's around Phu Bai, second CAG, around Da Nang, first CAG, around Chu Lai. This is also where we finally see some, you know, a at least an attempt uh, of, a cent of forming a centralized direction and trying to dictate a goal of some sort for these combined action platoons to work for work towards. Uh, this is the first time in the command records that I see actual orders going down, you know, to try to implement more civic action initiatives and things like that. However, by, you know, early 16, early 1969, it's too little too late. The United States has begun its withdrawal. The writing is very clearly on the wall for American forces, South Vietnamese forces and civilians, and for the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong. Uh, it, it, it's just, too little too late by that time. So CAP is going to slowly disband over an 18 month period from 1970 to 1971. Uh, the program will reach its apex at 114 platoons in early 1970. Most of those, however, are gonna be disbanded by that September. And one thing that's interesting is that although the Marines did have a Hamlet evaluation system that they tried to use to determine whether or not a, a village was, was able to secure itself, uh, those criteria as far as I can tell, did not dictate when a cap was moved or when it was disbanded in any way, shape, or form. Really, what, what what's going to dictate this is the accelerated pacification program, uh, which is you know aimed at withdrawing a certain amount of troops by a certain amount of dates and, and nothing more. And as we have warned time and again, counterinsurgency is not something that can be accelerated. So essentially, what happens is these. Uh, these caps are deactivated. They, they retrograde back towards Da Nang, which is the last place where mainline Marine infantry units are going to depart the country. Fourth CAG is disbanded in July of 1970. First and third CAG is disbanded in September of 1970. Second CAG will be the final one to be disbanded in May of 1971. And that is how the CAP program meets its end. So now that we've discussed the full trajectory, let, let's kind of provide a, a, again, a criminally brief assessment uh, of what the combined action platoon was and what it did. We'll start with the disadvantages, the deficiencies, all right? Inadequate planning and coordination plagued the program from beginning to end. Uh, now, to be fair, the, the Marines are improvising. Uh, they're improvising from the time that this program starts until the time that it ends. Uh, however, there is no effort at, com at, at com uh, you know, command and control until it is far too late. Uh, each platoon is doing its own thing. They are, uh, you know, these Marines are not receiving really any sort of direction from higher. Um, they're just, you know, they're, 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 they're acting locally. There, there's no attempt to coordinate between multiple villages, nothing like that. Also inadequate training. During the program's first two years, there is no formalized training structure whatsoever. Uh, there are former CAP schools finally established in late 1967 at Da Nang and at Fubai. Uh, however, even then, because of necessity, a lot of Marines were just, you know, skipped over the school. Uh, 
1967, it was because the program was expanding so rapidly, they just simply did not have time to train Marines before they put them into the villages. In 1968, it was because caps were taking such high casualties that, again, they did not have time to train these Marines. They just needed bodies to replace men they had lost in the villages. Recruiting qualified Marines was also an issue that eluded the combined action program from beginning to end. Uh, both Brute Krulak and Lieutenant Paul Eck famously said that in 1965, all of these Marines were hand selected. Uh, they were, you know, they were all volunteers. They were highly motivated to live and work alongside the Viet Cong. I should be, oh my word, uh, aside the South Vietnamese and the popular forces. Um, I have researched this issue extensively, and from what I can tell, that is not true in any way, shape, or form. Uh, I actually wrote an article about this that was just published in the Marine Corps History Journal uh, in their winter edition uh, that was just published. I, I would invite you to check that out if you want more information on that. Uh, but in brief, Marines joined the, the Combined Action Platoon for a variety of reasons. Some of them did, were, were the ideal volunteers that the program was looking for. Uh, many more volunteered just simply because it was a way out of the grunts. You know, they realized that, it, they, you know, some they thought that it was going to be less dangerous. In some cases, that was true. In some cases, that was not. They thought it would be a much easier duty. You know, uh, my generation of Marines, we would call it skating. I'm not sure if that's something that you know the kids say now <laughs> but uh which again in, in in some cases that was true in a lot of cases it wasn't however and there, there's also considerable evidence that commanding officers uh, particularly field grade off uh, company grade officers excuse me uh would use the combined action platoon to get rid of troublemakers get rid of marines who were incompetent or had bad attitudes which is precisely not the marine that you want to go into a program like this because uh, as a 1968 report said you know, a troublemaking, unmotivated Marine, the combined action platoon is exactly where he can do the most damage to the American effort in Vietnam. Uh, in late 1969 and in 1970, there's also very significant evidence that they stopped recruiting Marines from, from units already in country. Prior to that, you had to have been in country for at least three months, uh, no recorded disciplinary issues, allegedly things like that. Uh, in the latter stages of the war, they began to, to voluntell Marines Sometimes they would ask for volunteers. I've interviewed several who were voluntold straight out of ITR, Infantry Training Regiment, at Camp Pendleton. Uh, no idea where they, you know, where they were going, what they were going to be doing. They just pulled them out of the ranks, said, hey, this is where you're going, and they dropped them into a village. Uh, so th this recruitment issue is something that, that really, uh, it, you know, solving that problem eluded the Marines from the program start to finish. Uh, also, the combined action platoons, and I think this stems from the lack of command, uh, of command and control. They rarely had a plan in place to work themselves out of a job. I have interviewed Marines who were there in 65, you know, who were there in 71. In no case have I uncovered any evidence whatsoever that there is a, a codified plan of how we are going to teach these popular forces to do this job on their own once we leave. Uh, I've encountered no evidence that there was any sort of sense of urgency um, to impart, you know, that knowledge, impart those capabilities on their Vietnamese counterparts. Finally, there is the inescapable issue of space, and this is not something unique to the Combined Action Platoon program. This is something that all American forces encountered in Vietnam. There were simply too many villagers, too many villages, and not enough Marines to spread this program to the point where it could have made a meaningful impact on how the war was going. Now, that does not mean that the Combined Action Platoon was a waste. That does not mean that it did not accomplish anything. Uh, it could be a very effective way to deny communist forces access to the population, all right? Deny them access to food, recruits, and taxes. It could be an effective way at securing lines of communication, which is how the program was primarily used in its infant stages. It could also gain invaluable intelligence from locals. In that chapter that I'm writing on the case study at the Hotel Caps, there's pretty clear evidence that the Marines, they didn't know that the Tet Offensive was coming, but they knew something pretty big was coming in that area. Um, that's why the 5th Marine Regiment was, you know, moved up into the Fubai area just before Tet began. They knew something was up. Didn't know what, but they knew something. Morale was much higher within many of the combined action platoons. Uh, this is really, really the main thrust of that, that article I mentioned earlier. It, it, it gave these cap Marines a, a sense of personal connection with the war. They're not just, they don't feel like they're just mindlessly walking around in jungles and mountains looking for an enemy that they can't see. Uh, they became, in, in a lot of cases, they became a part of the villages in which they lived and in which they operated. They took part in the local economy. They, you know, in almost every single case, almost every single cat veteran I've, just, I've, I've consulted, 
they're inv invited to social institutions. They're invited to weddings, to feasts, you know, to other social celebrations. I've encountered evidence of Catholic Marines going to Catholic mass and worshiping alongside South Vietnamese Catholics, which is just fascinating. Uh, and and really, even in the war's later stages, there's pretty clear evidence of of a lot. And again, not in every case, but in a lot of these cat marines, they're you know they're, they're feeling like they still you know they're doing something worthwhile in this war. Uh, I read an account from a marine who served in 1971 in the cap's final stages, where a lot of guys in his platoon did not want to take R and R because they didn't want to leave the village, uh, which I think is really quite fascinating. So there there are, there are quite a, a lot of good things that we can pull from this program. There's quite a lot of good things that it did accomplish. So to conclude, uh, cap was indeed an innovative approach to the war in Vietnam, but not one that could have defeated the insurgency on its own. How Marines thought about irregular warfare and practiced for it prior to Vietnam curtailed the program's potential. Demonstration, it also demonstrates an evolution of thought in Vietnam. The CAP program evolved from a counter guerrilla initiative focused on kinetic action to an attempted counterinsurgency organization. However, CAP activities typically did not reflect this conceptual shift because that is just not how these Marines are wired to think. From start to finish, Combined action platoons sought to control terrain rather than the actual population. The biggest issue was the lack of command and control. No centralized planning or direction until it was time for the caps to disband and withdraw. Without clear direction from higher and armed with knowledge gained from a training regime solely based on high intensity conflict, that's the, the pre-war training regime, cap marines excelled at the hard side of point but struggled to implement its softer side. Thank you very much for your time and uh, I look forward to all of your questions. Great. Thank you very much, yeah. Cavender, for that, uh, that excellent presentation. Yeah. And first question from Albert Lee, and this actually uh, kind of ties back to some something I noted uh, when we were talking right before we recorded. So it's kind of kind of a two part question, sort of one general, one specific. Right. When we were talking before we kicked this off, you know, you'd mentioned that uh, I thought you'd seen some similarities between your study of the combined action program and then, you know, fast forward several decades to your own experiences in Afghanistan and, and things you, you know, saw with your uh, your fellow Marines out there. And then, um, so I guess part one of this is, you know, could you elaborate on some of those similarities that you sort of saw as you were going through your research for this? And then second part, and this is uh, Albert Lee's question is specifically noted on the recruitment of Marines fresh out of ITR with like zero familiar, you know, they're fresh out of basically, uh, I think we call it, you know, our IOC or advanced infantry training battalion today or school. It was, it was ITB when I was coming up. Yeah, ITB. Um, so, you know, SOI yeah. and then you go into AITB and then I think you're off to your your infantry platoon mm -hmm. you know with that would you consider that challenge of the the fresh out of out of training and then off to vietnam comparable to uh some issues seen by the u.s military sort of as a whole across the global war on terror in terms of recruiting and retaining talent that understood the situations in iraq and afghanistan yes absolutely um however um i will note in in my day uh, uh gonna sound like my dad here <laughs> um, uh, but uh, i will say you know in my day i think we we improved upon that as, as best we could. Uh, you know, during Vietnam, you didn't deploy, you know, with the exception of the very first units that go over there, you don't deploy as a battalion, you deploy as an individual. You know, so so fast forward to, I, I, I was, you know, too young for OIF, but at least in the OEF days, you know, your, your workup, your deployment is a, you know, at least a 10 to 12 month process. Um, and there was, you know, at least a, a concerted effort to have you understand you know, wh who the Afghans were, how they thought, you know, how they interacted with each other and with the world around them. Um, I went to God knows how many Pashtu and Dari classes. I didn't retain a ton of it, but I could, you know, I could say the basics, you know, hello, how are you? How is your family? Um, you know, I knew, you know, put your hand on your heart as a sign of respect when you meet somebody. Don't wave with your left hand. Don't pat kids on top of the head. Um, that, that That's all good, you know. You know, with, with with the combined action platoon program, what's fascinating is that in the first several years, years, not months, years, there's no attempt to teach that basic knowledge. And uh, and now, granted, they they did have that when Marines are pulled straight out of um, out of ITR and sent into this program. Uh, but but really, the main similarities that I see are you know are, are number one that, that that cultural divide. You got to figure out how to bridge that cultural divide, um, really, to see each other as human beings, you know, as fellow people. And, um, you know, I, I will say that the Marines definitely learned as they went along in Vietnam. Um, they definitely attempted to to solve that issue, uh, but it does not seem like it was something that even occurred to them 
before they went to Vietnam. And that is not to criticize them. You know, they, they encountered a situation in Vietnam that they had never encountered before. That is not to criticize them at all. Uh, but I do think that we learned that lesson that you need to you need to impart that knowledge on your Marines before you send them uh, into the before you send them in country. Now, that doesn't mean it's going to work. You know, it doesn't mean that it's not going to ensure success in that operation. Um, but I think that is something that we improved upon. Uh, secondly, was that issue of improving political legitimacy. Uh, we definitely improved on that area. I can't tell you how many pamphlets we were given or how many lectures we were given that stressed the importance of protecting the Afghan people above all else. Um, these talks were given both to your regular line companies and to your advisory units. And one thing that they always stressed was, you know, we're here to show these people that we can win, that we are the winning side, that it is better for them to throw in their lot with us uh, than with the Taliban. That is something we improved upon. Now, granted, that's not something that it doesn't guarantee success. You know, obviously it didn't work in Afghanistan. Um, I would argue that Iraq was a pyrrhic victory. Um, I won't go down that rabbit hole, <laughs> but uh, um, but that is that that is another issue that Marines in the Combined Action Platoon program with, from beginning to end was convincing, you know, convincing the the village, these people in these villages that, you know, to see beyond their villages. That, you know, to see that that government in Saigon does have your best interests at heart. Now, whether or not it did is debatable, um, but seeing, helping them see that is something that eluded them. I, I do think that we were better prepared for that in Afghanistan. Um, it did not work because Afghanistan is a tribal society. And, and, you know, most of these people, they don't see beyond their villages. They don't see beyond their valleys. If you talk to them about democracy, it's like, all right, that sounds well and good, but how is it going to help me feed my family this year? You know, um, and so um, so I, that th those are the parallels that I see, and there there there's certainly, you know, incremental improvements from uh, from one theater to the next. Uh, but you know, one thing to caution is that does not mean it's gonna you know, it's gonna it's gonna bring victory in the long term. But um, but but yeah, I'll I'll stop there. <laughs> okay, oh, great, appreciate it. So another question here from the chat, and this is from William Morgan, and uh, it kind of goes back to well, you know, one of the last points you had in your summary before wrapping up here. You know, noting that combined action program was not going to win the war on its own. But you'd also noted that it was a, a very um, not, it was not intensively resourced um, yeah. with, with a very small fraction of Marines, 1.5 percent serving in the program overall and the Army having even fewer programs like that. So this kind of gets into the, you know, the realm of, uh, you know, the road not taken kind of thing. But do you think that a, an increase in resources potentially to to do more cap type programs? Uh, combined with a, uh, a change to Westmoreland's search and destroy strategy um, might have had a greater impact? And well, it depends on how you define greater impact. <laughs> um, uh, in, yeah, the yes, in the sense that it could have more extensively secured lines of communication um, and other hard side coin things, yes. In terms of better accomplishing the soft side coin mission, no, I don't think so. Um, yeah, I, I, As a historian, I'm trained to to, to stray away from counterfactuals, but um, I'm going to issue that and meander down that path real quick. Uh, you know, maybe had the program been implemented in full force in 1959 or in 1960 instead of 1965 when things had spiraled, you know, when the social, when the, the political situation had spiraled just so far out of control, maybe. Um, but I, I, I don't think that you could have put every single Marine who was in Vietnam during the height of the war in 68 and 69 into a cap, and you're still not going to be able to cover every single village in the I-Corps tactical zone. So, and, you know, and even if you could, then how do you support them, you know? And so, um, you know, yeah, cr chronic lack of support was an issue, but, um, you know, it certainly would have made the program function better, uh, but I don't think it would have changed the outcome. Great, thank you. Yeah, I, you said the counterfactual, and I got reminded back to the the old What If series of history books, which are which are entertaining, but not necessarily good history. Yeah, they're, they're fun to read, but... <laughs> yeah. Um, but no, I appreciate you, uh, you, uh, you making a, a good try at that. Um, so I, I'll give you one more question. And then if we don't have anything else in the chat here, we'll actually uh, another question in the chat here from Albert Lee. See, so the question is looking, uh, I think, I guess this is his take, um, him taking a look at some Malaya emergency era, Malayan police vehicles used for emergency duties. Was the Malayan emergency the object of any comparative study by the U.S. and its counterinsurgency efforts in Vietnam? You know, was it reflected in any of the CAP training, I, I guess, training or application that the ones who did go to the training uh, receive? Uh, somewhat, yes. Um, I have, I, I did a, an extensive uh, study of TBS curricula, um, and uh, I did this past year, actually. And in some of those core syllabi, I do see very limited examinations of the Malayan emergency. 
Um, there was actually a very prominent British uh, general and thinker named Sir Robert Thompson um, who wrote a book um, on, you know, called Defeating Communist Insurgency in Malaya. And, and, and so that was certainly on the Marines radar. Um, I, I, I do not see any evidence of it being implemented in the CAP platoon uh, training curriculum. One thing to keep in mind about Malaya is that the British won in one, in one part because they had a very firm footprint in Malaya before the Second World War. They had a very firm footprint there. And they had also, they had a very cordial relation for the most part with the Malayans themselves. Uh, so, and, and the British had committed to, to, uh, to offering them independence after the Second World War. Another thing is that the Malayans had, you know, relatively speaking, had strong and well-developed political and legal institutions when that insurgency began that South Vietnam did not have. So the counterinsurgency effort in Malaysia had a much stronger foundation on which to build its efforts than the counterinsurgency effort in Vietnam ever did. Great, thank you. All right, I'll throw my question out there and then uh, we can go ahead and wrap things up here. But in it's sort of a, a broader ranging question about your uh, your overall look and I'm sort of asking it in line of our own center of innovation and future warfare here is, um, from what you've looked at the program, you know, looked, you looked at the things that were weak and the things that were strong, but what are a couple of, of key takeaways about what they did that you think are still worth modeling or maybe adapting in, in both the Marine Corps or across the armed services today for future operations? So I do think that there is a lot of merit in, in fighting a conflict like this at the village level, at the personal level. Um, this, it made the war personal for a lot of these Marines. Where you know they don't they're they're not just uh, they're not just counting down the clock until their 13 months are up and they can go home. Um, they are you know in a lot of cases they are committed. They're committed to the fight because they're committed to the people. You know they're committed. You know they they may not they may not necessarily understand them. They might not even like them, <laughs> but by living next to them and living among them day in and day out, they're seeing that they're human beings. You know they're just trying to get by and provide for their families. They're just trying to survive. Uh, and in a lot of cases, that made this war personal for these Marines. Um, you know, uh, Brute Krulak famously argued in First Fight that 60%, 60% of Cat Marines volunteered to extend their tours by six months so that they could stay with their villages. Now, there is a caveat to that figure that he does not elaborate on. That is based on the very first four, four Cat platoons that were set up around Fubai in 1965. 60% of those Marines did extend to stay. I've done my best to try to figure out how consistent that was throughout the program's uh, six year lifespan. Uh, unfortunately, three math did not take detailed records on that. Uh, but from what I can gather, um, the rate was not 60%, but it was definitely around 40, which is much higher than regular units, especially among the infantry. Uh, you know, these Marines, they didn't want to go home because they felt like they, they were personally responsible you know, not so much for winning the war, but for helping those people. So there is certainly merits to that that we can adopt um, as we, you know, plan for a potential counterinsurgency contingency in the future. Uh, now the trick is to balance that with, you know, with your more kinetic, uh, you know, line company, line battalion operations, because uh, it, it seems like there is a pretty clear symbiotic relationship between the two, at least within the CAPS trajectory. Uh, I'm working on editing a book uh, with a cat veteran named William F. Nemo, who did a um, a pretty impressive detailed study of the combined action platoon up until um, the 1968, excuse me, up until the uh, the Tet Offensive, uh, and really that is the central theme of his book. And I think there's a lot of merit to that. Now I'm not a practitioner, you know, I left the Marine Corps over to over a decade ago. Um, what that process looks like, I'm not sure because I've never commanded an infantry company. I've you know never commanded a battalion. Um, but I do think there is a merit to welding those two ideas together because it, you know, it shows the Marines why they're there, um, or the, you know, or the soldiers or whomever, why they're there. Um, and it, uh, you know, it, it, it certainly fosters a more deep connection to, um, you know, to, to doing the job right and, um, and, and, and standing up for these people and, and doing your best to help these people. Hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, it, it definitely does. And, um, I don't want to wander down another hole too long, but I think your your point about like the personal connection aspect has been um, really key. And I know that from for, from our side here in the, the Krulak Center, uh, it, you know, separate series, we've been doing a lot of intensive um, look at the war in Ukraine going on right now for coming up on a year here now. But um, part of what we've sort of tried to bring to the, the wider audience here and those who follow us is like those people's stories. So we've been fortunate enough to, to have – 
I think three or four um, individuals in Ukraine talking to us live from where they're at to give that perspective. And yeah, I think it, it really makes it real, um, real in a sense that, you know, we're not just talking about whatever the, the map changes are on any given day or, you know, numbers of tank destroyed like there. Yeah, there's human beings involved in there. Um, you know, it might be, you know, they're one small sort of data point on that field, but it makes you realize yeah. there's a lot more out there. And they know what they're fighting for. And that explains why they've performed the way they have so far. Those people know what they're fighting for. The Russian soldiers, by and large, do not. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, morale is important. And um, so. Yeah, and I, and that, I think that contrasts in a, in a good way. Well, contrast or parallels going back to Vietnam combined action program is is that that morale, that both the moral factor and the morale factor is understanding why you're there and what you're doing. So, you know, I, I get that maybe uh, Peru Krulak was had a smaller data set that he was talking about, you know, but I, I think that 60 percent extension is a pretty key point knowing they at least knew what they were fighting for and they wanted and, and, to. And even if it was even if it was as low as, you know, 25 or 30 percent, that is still very significant. It's very significant. Uh, and it's much higher rate than you see, in, especially in, in, you know, in just in the regular infantry, a much higher rate. And so uh, you know, that, that number cannot be discounted. Yeah, there was definitely, definitely dynamic going on there that, that motivated those Marines. OK, we've been past an hour and I want to make sure that we let everybody else uh, transition to the rest parts of their day. So, Captain Sutton, thank you very much for your time today and as well, kind of working with us to find a time to schedule it. Sometimes it's hard to make all the stars align, but thanks for your, your persistence. And as well, it's always great to have a former Marine on the program and, you know, sort of show our, our PME audience, especially that, hey, this is something you can do once you get out. Right. Um, and right. to the rest of, rest of our audience, thanks for joining us today. And as a reminder, this is just the first in a, a aggressive broadcast schedule we have going this week. Coming this Thursday, we're going to have uh, Team Krelak Zone China subject matter expert, Mr. Dan Rice and Matt Kansian from the Naval War College to dig deeper into the recent CIS, CSIS war game focused on a potential Chinese amphibious invasion of Taiwan. And then Friday, we welcome two Marines from Training and Education Command to dig into the meat of the new Training and Education 2030 report slash plan, which is the third leg of the triad supporting Force Design 2030 under the Commandant's Planning Guidance. Uh, another two great episodes to make sure that uh, you guys, everybody register and follow us. Uh, just could be good. And uh, Cavender, maybe we'll see you there on Friday. Um, or if not, you'll we, you'll definitely be able to find it online once we're done. Absolutely. Um, and I'll say one last thing to the audience. I made a note that Marine Corps History Journal article that he mentioned, I'm going to make sure and put a link to that in the show notes so you can go ahead and, and read that piece as well. Sir, thank you very much for your time. And to our yeah. audience, thank you as well. And uh, we'll see you on the next one. Yeah, super fun. Great. Thanks for joining us. As always, we depend on support and feedback from the Team Crewland community to constantly improve our offerings and reach a wider audience. So if you have feedback on this episode, please take a moment to fill out the survey linked in the show notes to help us do better. Also, if you enjoyed this episode, please hit the like button and subscribe to our channel on YouTube or leave us a review on the podcast app of your choice. It truly does help us reach a wider audience. Thank you as always for your support and we'll see you on the next episode. Education is what's important. Training, preparation for the expected. Education, preparation for the unexpected.